flow, when you learn, teach, and when you get, give. Welcome to Conversations with Verdell Jones. I'm your host, Verdell Jones. Being an educator at heart, I'm dedicated to sharing conversations that inform and enlighten in the hopes that you learn something you may not have known. And remember, in the words of Maya Angelou, when you learn, teach, and when you get, give. We have a great show for you today. I'm, I'm so excited to bring you this information. Uh, you know, to see some of my past shows, you can go to my YouTube channel. Just search Delhi Teach, D-E-L-I. T-E-A-C-H, and make sure you please subscribe so you can see all of my upcoming shows and all of my past shows as well. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Delhi Teach, and we're always looking for sponsors, so if you're interested in sponsoring the Conversations with Verdell Jones show, you can contact me as well on my website at verdelljones.com. So we have a fabulous guest with us today. Uh, you know, domestic violence is defined as violent or aggressive behavior within the home, typically involving the violent abuse of a spouse or partner. Uh, we, we have uh, statistics, uh, some statistics in reference to domestic violence. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of alarming. It, it's, it's really something that is, um, you know, it's, it's prevalent within our society. Um, you know, so we can just show that, that quick uh, graphic there in reference to some statistics. Every nine seconds, a woman is battered. Um, a lot of times they don't they don't go reported either to the police whether it be a rape or physical abuse or stalking uh, and homelessness homeless families a lot of the main reasons some families are homeless is because of domestic violence as well so today we have uh, Michelle Medina and she is the author of a new book when it's time to let go taking control of abuse and this is her story of, of how she went through uh, an abusive relationship and, and made it out so I want to welcome you to the show thank you so much for being here thank you for having me thank you uh, just if we can just show a quick um, this is her book uh, I was able to read the book, uh, you know, within a couple of days. It, it's really a, a quick read, and and the information that she shares in the book is is really, you know, you're really telling a lot about what you went through. So I'm really, you know, happy that you were able to share this information with other women who might be going through the same thing. So let's get started because we have a lot that we that we want to cover. I, I first want to uh, again welcome you. Thank you. Um, and. Why did you decide to write this book? The purpose of me writing the book is to empower victims of domestic violence mm -hmm. to stop suffering in silence and to get the help that they need. And I felt that by sharing my experiences mm -hmm. and from them hearing from someone that went through what they went through, they would truly understand and I could actually reach into their heart and actually convince them to try to get the help that mm -hmm. they need. And was there a point when you said to yourself, you know what, I, I really need to write this book and I really need to share this information. I, I'm making assumptions. I'm sure it wasn't immediately after this happened, no. but like how, what was the buildup? Like how long did it really take you to say to yourself, you know what, I really can help other women that have gone through this and you wanted to write the book? Well, um, I noticed that there were, there's a lot of things going on, you know, on television and mm -hmm. real life things that are happening. And a lot of the stories that were out there were similar to my experience. Mm. So I felt that by me sharing my story, okay. at least it would help others to try to get out and not go through what I, what I went through mm -hmm. if I could help. Right. And, you know, as you're, you know, you're talking, uh, you know, in the book and reading through the book, how long was the relationship that you had with your, uh, with your ex-husband? How, how long did that span? What was the time frame? It was about two years that mm -hmm. we were together okay. when we split. Okay. Um, we, when we met, it had to be maybe about four months or so. Mm -hmm. Though it sounds like a very short period of time, mm -hmm. um, wow. he was very charming. Mm -hmm. um, but then that turned to him becoming more of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Right, right. He became controlling, mm -hmm. possessive. 
And once the verbal abuse began, the physical abuse right, started. Right. Right. So when you first met him, because you describe him in the book, and you know, uh, you know, your attraction to him mm -hmm. early on, um, or in hindsight, I should say, did you uh, kind of think about really when you first met him, were there signs? I thought that mm -hmm. he was in a rush to right. get married and he must mm -hmm. have proposed to me at least six times okay before i said okay 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 i'll marry you mm -hmm. that sort of thing but um it really mm. really what it was is his mother she knew we were living together and she was a very spiritual person okay and she basically said you shouldn't be living in sin why don't you guys go ahead and get married okay so i believe that that was really hmm. it that is the reason why I went ahead and did it. Right. And so, and you had only known him for a short period of time before you actually got married. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You, you describe meeting him in a restaurant. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's it's so interesting because a lot of times you you had mentioned that he was a charmer. Yes. Um. You know that that men who uh, you know abuse women they they really have a different side to them and you do describe this Jekyll and Hyde um, yes. type of personality that he had mm -hmm. um, how did that manifest itself throughout you know your relationship um, well basically um, when he was the nice person that he was that was what the front that he put on for everyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but behind closed doors, he was a monster. Right. So he had everybody fooled. He even had me fooled sure. in the very beginning. And right. And then he just changed. So it was something that mm -hmm. he withheld until right. he finally just let it out. Mm -hmm. And what was the process like for you um, in writing the book? So, you know, you had to, while writing the book, I would imagine, relive a lot of the trauma. And it really is trauma that you went through. What was that process like for you? Was it, um, was it cathartic? Was it, like, how, how did that feel having to tell, you know, those personal deep stories and, on, you know, put it down on paper? It was very difficult mm -hmm. um, because... I'm a private person. Mm -hmm. and, right. and, and a lot of <laughs> victims are right they don't want to really tell everyone sure what they went through and as i was writing it i did relive it and i was crying and writing <laughs> and getting up at <laughs> two o'clock in the morning writing some more you know so i really had to tap into those emotions mm -hmm. in order to to feel get that feeling into the book so right. that other people when they read my book they would feel that they were there right as I wrote it right yeah yeah that's that's true and it, it, you know in reading through the book the experiences and the trauma that you experienced throughout the relationship was it, it was almost unbelievable that someone could actually treat another human being that way yes you know it yes. real so that really did and and it, and it seemed also that it was ongoing yeah it was like a, a daily occurrence yes. of, of this type of, of abuse. Um, so, I, you know, I thank you for writing the book and sharing your story with, with others um, so that they might, you know, get some help. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, that as well. We're going to take a, a short break. And when we come back, we're going to bring in Dr. Bernadette Morrison to help us kind of understand the patterns of behavior of domestic abuse and how women can get help. So um, Dr. Morrison has a private practice, so we're gonna put up her information, um, her website, and we're gonna bring her back, uh, we're gonna bring her on in just a second and continue our conversation. Uh, that's uh, Michelle's, uh, Dr. Morrison's, there we go. Um, there we go. So we're gonna have Dr. Morrison come in, um, and you know we're gonna continue this conversation about um, domestic abuse.
Okay, welcome back. We have Dr. Bernadette Morrison with us. She's an educator, uh, psychotherapist, clinical consultant, and author. Uh, as I said before, she has her own private practice, and she helps several people work through uh, their mental health issues. And she's also the author of a book called Cyberdelity, and I had the pleasure of reading that book as well. If we could just show a, a quick clip of a uh, quick shot of her book, Cyberdelity. Um, this is a, 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 a fictional story based on your uh, professional um, experiences in working with your clients. So that, that was definitely, a, a, you know, an interesting read. Um, so I would encourage you, again, um, Dr. Marson, she does have her own private practice. We'll be giving some information at the end. So I want to thank you so much for joining us in the conversation. Um, you know, this is such a serious, serious issue. Uh, we were ta I was talking with um, Michelle off camera. We were talking about the San Bernardino incident um, that happened. And this was clearly a case of domestic violence. And it ended so uh, Tragic. uh, tragically. I, you know, I just, it, it's, it's so upsetting that these things actually go on. Why do, why do you think domestic violence is so prevalent in our society? A lot of it has to do with power and control, mm -hmm. you know, someone exerting power. I was listening to Michelle speak and, you know, as I'm hearing mm -hmm. her, um, I'm listening to all the different, uh, it's like a cycle, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, when right. he began, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, how he was this charming mm -hmm. guy that you fell for. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and this is usually the case. This is how it begins. Mm -hmm. but first, I want to say to Michelle, you know, Thank you for your courage in being able to talk about yes. the experience that you have had. Because many, like you said, they live in the shadow. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. of that fear of discussing their experience. And many times it's also shame. Mm -hmm. We right. also have to look at many do not even survive to tell their story. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because if we look at a lot of the uh, homicides and suicides, 72% of those cases mm -hmm are related to domestic violence. Right, right, wow. Then that's an alarming statistic. Absolutely, And yeah. you know, Absolutely. the thing also that w with domestic violence is you're, you were in a relationship which you thought was a loving relationship or was supposed right. to be a loving relationship yes. and then it just turns, mm -hmm. you know, and so you're really, in my mind, kind of caught off guard. Right. But I mean, ex I mean, uh, really caught off guard yeah. because you don't expect someone that profess that they love you mm -hmm. to treat you in in this manner. And right. and I think that's so. It's such an upsetting part of the of the whole of this whole cycle, as you said. Um, you know, what are some other um, patterns of domestic abuse? And then we'll we'll talk a little bit about you know how you experience them as well. well one of the things, just let me begin also by saying, I know you posted the statistics, mm -hmm. but I'd like to really talk about mm -hmm. it because you are one of the victims and you're one of the survivors. Right. And like I said, there are many who do not survive. Mm -hmm. One in three women experience domestic violence during their lifetime. Mm. Wow. A population we don't talk about is the men. Right. Mm -hmm. One in four men experience domestic violence mm -hmm. during their lifetime also. Right. Right. What we're also seeing at an alarming rate is the young people. Mm -hmm. The ages between 16 and 24, mm -hmm. there are high rates of domestic violence right. within that age group. Mm. So part of it is looking mm -hmm. at, okay, what causes it? And one of the things that you you know, we can look at is, uh, you know, I always go back from ch to childhood. Mm -hmm. Did that individual experience or witness? Right. Yeah. Okay, was it intergenerational? Because mm -hmm. most of the time it's intergenerational, mm -hmm. where it passes from one um, generation to, uh, to, the to the next. Right. Um, you also have to look at whether there's substance abuse involved. Mm -hmm. You know, so most of the time we look at... Um, even though that's not the major cause for it, but we look at that as one of the as risk well. factors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Substance abuse. Um, we also look at, you know, because of the fact it impacts everyone, whether it's religion, I know you talked about, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, religion, yes. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. no matter what your economic status is, right. no matter There's what no your bad, educational yeah. status is, mm -hmm. it impacts upon everyone. So you have lived the experience and you have lived it to tell it, mm -hmm. all right? So usually one has to go back into that person's mm -hmm. history to find out exactly what may have caused them to be an abuser. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. or was he abused? Right. Not just witnessed it, but was he also abused mm -hmm. during his childhood? Hmm. So, and for the abuser, it's it could be what they witness someone doing to uh, you know someone else, yes. and they take that on. You know, sometimes you hear the extremes. Oh, I'm never going to be like that. But for some reason, sometimes they can't help but you yes. know and be uh, in that situation. Yes. Um, so, Michelle, how how did it kind of what were some of the um, you know did you see those patterns within because you, you talk in the book a lot about um, isolation mm -hmm. you know yes. uh, you talk about the normalcy of the situation can you speak a little bit about those two aspects um, as far as the isolation he was very he wanted to be very private where he didn't want me around my family mm -hmm. or my friends. And whenever they did come over, he made them feel uncomfortable where they didn't want they to didn't stay. Want mm -hmm. And he would move. We moved four times in two years. Wow. <laughs> um, so he didn't want anyone around. He right. wanted me in a box so he could do whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want anyone else to know what was going on, what he claims in our household. Right, right. And how did he, because you also, and, and this is a pattern that we see, after a, a, an episode, an abusive experience would happen, mm -hmm. the apologies would start. And the gifts. And the gifts would start. And the fur coats. And, <laughs> and the cars. Right, yes. right, right. So it seemed as if, you know, if you, I mean, you know, as, as difficult as that, may may sound it seems like okay this is the reward for me doing this to you yes basically i think he just wanted that guilt off of him right so okay. he wanted to present a face where i did something nice for you you should forgive mm -hmm. what i did to you right right basically just to forget about it let's let's start over mm -hmm. kind of thing like a reset button yes right but and this was uh, you know a pattern a, a pattern exactly yes. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, women uh, that are abused, they kind of suffer in silence. Why do they, um, why do they suffer in silence? A lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. It's that shame. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the guilt. Yeah. It's the fear because most of the times, one, I'm not sure if you experienced it, but they are usually threats. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Threats to family. Threats to family to, to also, to the the victim, right. to their children, right. mm -hmm. all of those things. Um, we also look at a lot of immigrants also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they threaten that, let's say if they are probably um, hmm. working on getting them their, uh, you know, their documents mm -hmm. um, within um, wow. the United States, um, the form of power they use is that they can destroy all of that or threaten that, you know, mm. they would not go through with the proceedings. So all of that, it's another component of it also. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different factors. I know, uh, you know, as I was reading the book, you were talking about options. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and as I was reading the book, you know, I'm saying to myself, and, you know, I, I think I'm pretty, you know, savvy or educated, mm -hmm. but even me as a woman knowing what abuse is and mm -hmm. being in a counseling profession, you know, even though, you know, in a high school level, um, I was saying to myself, why didn't she just leave? Why didn't she, you know, that you, because you talk about options. So it's, I'm, I'm sure you've heard mm -hmm. that, oh, that yeah. response oh, yeah. many times. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have. I have. And um, like the doctor has said, mm -hmm. I was threatened. Right. I was threatened that if I left, he was going to call CPS on me, tell right. me that I was a bad mother, mm -hmm. have my child taken away from me. Right. Um, and he also had weapons in the house. Mm. So yeah. when you see someone who has these kind of weapons that you only see on TV, mm. You will believe that if he says he's going to use it, right. he very well can use it. Right, exactly. And when you talk about the options, what were your options in staying in the relationship? What what did you tell yourself? These okay, these are the only things that I could do besides leave. How did you how did you manage to, you know, to get through that that process and then finally make the move? We'll talk about how you actually were able to make the move, but what were some of the options that you thought you were faced with at that time? Well, I know financial. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit right. big risk yeah. um, that I didn't have the 
sources mm -hmm. to actually move out on my own. Otherwise, right. I would have done that. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, um, it ha also had to do with me being out of work. Mm. Um, yeah. Other things, things kept coming up. Mm -hmm. So, as you see, when you read in a the book, there were a lot of cliffhangers at the end of each chapter. Right, Something right. always mm -hmm. came up. It started from... I had a dream that someone was after him and mm -hmm. we moved and he wanted to start over again. Mm -hmm. And then there was another situation where I was found that I was pregnant, right. so then I couldn't leave. Mm -hmm. um, so, And then a lot of it had to do with my oldest son. I was fighting his father for custody. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to present uh, a good, stable home. Right. And for me to do that at that time was, was not a good time to do it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go back to my family as a failure, that I had a failed right. marriage. Right. So I tried to just pray and try to just, I dealt with it. Mm -hmm. I was numb, you know, yeah. to it, mm -hmm. and, and I it consumed me. Absolutely. And I know that that is not the best option for me, but that's how I coped with mm -hmm. it at the time. Right, and and is that, is that what you normally see with women that go through this? Absolutely, yeah. there are barriers for them to leave. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're hoping that the person would change. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yep. they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you know, absolutely. you find a lot of that also. Mm -hmm. um, again, maybe for the, like you said, the sake of the children right. and the financial piece, it's a major it's a piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are so many other reasons. Um, and again, like mm. I said, the threats, and that's usually a major piece major also piece um, it. with it. W just coming back to one mm -hmm. of the things that you, you have said with regards to him actually, um, you know, you use the word reward. We call it right. reconciliation. Okay. You know, um, when, when you look at, I'm sure that happened numerous times, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. where you have to make up, you know, everything seems to be okay, but mm -hmm. it's only okay f just for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then exactly. it's like the cycle begins again. The honeymoon mm -hmm. period yeah. begins again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that cycle goes on and then the abuse begins, mm -hmm. etc. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you describe that so vividly in, mm -hmm. in the book. There was always something yes. else. Well, I can't do this because of that and mm -hmm. you know, and, and what uh, you know there's for some reason and we were talking about this a little bit women who are in the situation seem you know like there's a stigma to it meanwhile they're they're the ones who are the victim in the situation it's it's right. not your fault right right <laughs> you know exactly. um but for some reason you know the manipulation manipulation is such a major piece mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. and uh you know these these men who abuse women are such great manipulators yes um and they're able to um you know, to manipulate you to think that this is what you this is what you must do, right? You know, right. and the threats don't help as well. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's pretty scary. Yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of it is scary, and I know his yeah. behaviors changed as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you write about that too. Um, the behaviors that he was exhibiting um, that were a little odd. Do mm -hmm. you think that was because he was trying to intimidate, or was there really something that was was going on? I think it could have been a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, he definitely always tried to intimidate me. Right. Um, but I don't know if there was any other medical conditions that was going mm -hmm. on because okay. he was paranoid. Right. He would prop the couch up against the back of the door so nobody could get in and I could get out. Wow. So he, he did a lot of strange things. Mm -hmm. So I think it could have been a combination of both. Right, right. and. Why is it important um, for and how can women who experience this to get help? And what type of help do they do they need? Well, one has to be careful <laughs> with the getting help also because okay. if the uh, abuser find out that they are getting mm -hmm. help, mm -hmm. okay. sometimes yes. that leads to death right. also. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, wow. one of the first things that we mm. talk about is developing what we call a safety plan. Right. Okay. okay. That's one of the first things when you're in a domestic mm -hmm. violence situation. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about him blocking the door. Yes. So part of that safety plan would be you knowing, finding an exit mm -hmm. in the event that you need to get out, whether it's through a window or right. whatever that exit is. Right. Yeah. You talked about him having weapons in the house. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. How can I hide some of those weapons, like the knives, etc., mm -hmm. so he may not be able to right. have access to it? Mm -hmm. So it's developing a safety plan. If there is an issue, okay, do I have at least five places that I can go to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I have another cell phone number? Mm -hmm. Another cell phone, actually. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things. Also, 
you know, having knowing numbers that you can call right, in the right. case of an emergency, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's 911. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of. Um, we have the uh, National Coalition for Domestic Violence. Right. Mm -hmm. They have a 24-hour hotline. That's another resource. On Long Island, we have also Vibes. That's another resource, and they're also 24 hours. Mm. So a lot part of it is knowing all of these 24-hour hot lines that you can call because there's someone always available to answer mm -hmm. any questions, any or, questions or help you. Or help you. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the things I think was, uh, you know, a lot of domestic violence incidents go unreported to the police. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you did do, and it took you courage to right. do that, was to reach out to law enforcement to get that help. Yes. How did, how did you get the courage to be able to do that without fear of the repercussions? Well, I was <laughs> at a point where I was at my wit's end. Mm -hmm. I couldn't deal with it anymore. Mm -hmm. Because to be honest with you, I would rather have died that night than to mm. live with that man another day. Right. Yeah. So when I called the police, well, actually, I tried to call the police, mm -hmm. and he kept smacking the phone out of my hand. I was able to contact one person, my sister-in-law at the time, and she called the police for me. Okay. I don't know what she said to them, but mm -hmm. they came with their guns drawn. Wow. And, and that's how I was able, I had him arrested, and I had 24 hours to pack the whole house and not come back, and, and that's how I got out. Wow. And you know, you mentioned your sister-in-law, and we were talking a little bit about this too, um, and you said that she was non-judgmental. Oh, yeah. So yeah. that was somebody that you could actually reach out to. How, as a support system, um, you know, I'll ask, ask you first, how as a support system can someone help a friend or a family member that's going through this because there is that level of judgment, like the why don't you just leave mentality. Mm -hmm. So how is, as a, a family can you support someone who's, who's going through this? Well, one of the things is being able to listen right. because you don't know what that other person is experiencing. Mm -hmm. So the key piece is listening and probably even finding, helping them in finding resources um, such as, you know, I talked mm -hmm. about those um, resources and also I would encourage anyone who is in a domestic violence situation to seek help mm -hmm. and to seek psychological help right. because psychologically it impacts upon the individual Absolutely. and not just the individual you talked about having children in the mm -hmm. home mm -hmm. because not only does it impact upon the victim but also the children, children. especially mm -hmm. if they might you know be hearing what's happening mm -hmm. and children are very intuitive yes, so most are. of the time they know what's happening so it's not just a victim but also the you know the children within the home and definitely the abuser right yes and do you find that the abusers often seek help very rare yeah. do they seek help because guess what? Most of the time they don't think they have the problem. Yeah. It's the mm -hmm. other person who has the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. It's what they did. It's not absolutely. what they did. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Now you talked about him being paranoid. I don't know whether he had a mental illness mm -hmm. also. Right. Yeah. Because that's another risk factor also and mm -hmm. that can contribute towards that. So it, there's a lot of different components one has to look into um, when they're domestic violence situations. You know, and just going back with, in reference to um, law enforcement and, and getting law enforcement involved, mm -hmm. and one of the, um, you know, police officers, they come to a scene that's, that's a domestic violence mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know, but you know, I'm, I'm going by what I see on TV. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They react different in different situations. So what is, how did you feel that um, you know, law enforcement was able to help you, or do you ha or did you have situations where you didn't feel they were helping at all? Because sometimes they'll take the side mm -hmm. of the man, or sometimes they'll be a little bit more aggressive and help the woman. So how did how did that kind of work for you when you um, you know sought out to get help from law enforcement? Well, from my experience and with the orders of protection okay. that I've gotten, mm -hmm. um, normally when there is a weapon involved. Right. They are more okay. proactive. Mm -hmm. When there isn't a weapon involved, I basically would have to file a police report, go to the court, file a petition for order of protection. Mm -hmm. And it's in the court's hands. Okay. Um, and then when you go to court, you have to prove 
that this person that proved the domestic violence mm -hmm. to get that order of protection. Mm -hmm. And is that, how does, how does that go? You know, are you able, obviously you were able to get an order of protection for or a stay away order for a long period of time. Yes. How is that process being able to, because again, you, you're going to have to relive, mm -hmm. you know, your, your experience and how is that getting through the court systems and being, being able to do that? Was it a, easy is not the right word, but was it a process that you uh, find that women can actually, you know, accomplish? It can be done. Yeah. Um, it's just basically going down to the court, filing a petition mm -hmm. for the order of protection, and you'll get a temporary, but then you got to go back okay. to court to get a permanent mm -hmm. uh, order, which was usually, the one that I had was a span of a year. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. When I got the one that was for the five years stay away, mm -hmm. that had to do with the threats weapon sort of thing. Okay. And that's how I was able to get that. But I had to go to trial. Okay. I had to go to trial, so I had to talk about everything mm -hmm. he'd done to me and basically relive it, and mm -hmm. I couldn't hold the tears back right. in front of the judge. Mm -hmm. And it, I just felt like I was the one being blamed exactly. for the way that right. he treated exactly. me just to get an order of protection so he could leave me alone. Right. And was he there? He was there. And he was there. He was there. Right. Right. I had to look him in the face, mm -hmm. and I had to explain everything that he did to me, and it 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 was the roughest and the hardest thing that I ever had to do. Right, right. And are, are courts, um, you know, from, from your experience, are they, um, you know, because you hear of an order of protection and then you hear people breaking those order of protections or the stayaways and like what has been your experience with working with women that are in this situation and how they, it, sometimes it seems like such, it seems like a desperate situation and a losing battle in some instances because you hear of these tragic stories and I'm so happy mm -hmm. that, that you're here to share. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> you know, how, how does that, how do women get through that? And, and you're right, because of the fact that, um, you hear the tragic stories even though mm -hmm. they have the order of protection, right, even right, though right. they have the restraining order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, in order to get that five year, mm -hmm. they had to be that weapon yeah. involved. Right, right. All right because mm -hmm. usually it might be six months, it might be a year that you will, and in order for you to, um, to get, a, you know, it, get it extended, you have to prove that, you know, he's mm -hmm. a danger, whether yes. it's to you or the kids, yeah, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. And like she said, you know, that can be very disturbing for her because of the experiences that she's had. And it's like reliving the experience each right. time mm -hmm. that she has to go through it. Um, plus, uh, sometimes it's a cost because to, to most individuals, because they have to hire an attorney. Um, that's the other piece wow. also. Yeah, I didn't um, think about that. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a major cost mm -hmm. um, for the victim. Um, if they wow. have to hire an attorney. Some of them actually may qualify for legal aid, mm -hmm. but others, unfortunately, don't, don't. qualify for legal aid. Um, you talked wow. about police officers. Mm -hmm. uh, again, too, it all depends on the police yeah. officer. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, you know, some of them, are, like you said, would either take the side of the male or the female. Most of the times, they will take the side of the females mm -hmm. based upon what I've known and my experience okay. with Suffolk County. Okay. And they've been pretty good in most of the cases that I'm aware of okay. um, in the work that they do so I commend them for that mm -hmm. um, most of the cases that are but again like I said you know mm -hmm. e every case is different. different every officer who you know um, turns up on the scene of a case it's, mm -hmm. it's totally different they'll respond totally different mm -hmm. um, but the cases that I have um, experienced um, mm -hmm. they have been you know um, very good in doing it um, you had to leave the home mm -hmm. most of the times mm -hmm. it's the um, the abuser right. who has to leave the home mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting that you were the one who had to leave the home hmm. But even in leaving the home and even having the order of protection, I still encourage women to be vigilant, to still have those, um, you know, safety. You, you know, if you're driving, you yeah. you have to be checking, is anyone following right. me? Mm -hmm. Because they can change their vehicles. They can borrow another someone else's right. vehicle. They can follow you to your job because a lot of um, incidents occur on the on job, the, yeah. uh, you know, and in different environments that you probably would not expect mm -hmm. it to happen. Mm -hmm. Right, and you had shared uh, with me also that you were constantly looking over your mm -hmm. shoulder. Oh yes, you know, yes. Um, because you you never know. It might be okay for uh, the woman in San Bernardino was the same situation. Mm -hmm. She was okay for a couple of months, and then all of a sudden, yeah, you know. So I, I don't know, 
you know, li living in that constant fear, uh, you know, definitely takes a toll on on your physical and your mental health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so how do, how do you help women get get through that as far as because um, esteem is is I'm sure is, is you know is another issue because for the period of time that you're in this relationship you know, slowly but surely your self-esteem is, is being chipped away, yeah. you know, being in this situation. Well, mm -hmm. you know, women who have been in that situation, and you probably can relate to that, mm -hmm. experience a whole slew of emotions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From helplessness to hopelessness. Right. From mm -hmm. depression to anxiety. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's like sometimes suicidal ideations, yeah. yes. mm -hmm. right. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. comes about. Absolutely. So there's a whole slew of emotions, in addition to which there's a lot of physical ailments yeah. that comes along right. with it. The headaches, mm -hmm. the back pain, the stomach pain, all of those things, and probably you're not even relating it right to, to what that. some of the yeah. stresses that you're experiencing from that. Mm -hmm. Right, and just, you know, you're living your day to day with this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sense of, uh, you know, this anxious feeling or not knowing what's going to happen day to day has to take, you know, its toll. Right. Uh, and being able to function, you know, being able to work, being able well, to, right. you know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, you yeah. talk about work, actually, mm -hmm. it's a high cost mm -hmm. to most to the industry. <sighs> for working mm, people right. because it decreases um, a lot of productivity, productivity. Absolutely. all right? Um, many times if a person is not feeling well, what do they do? They'll call, They'll in. call in or they may have medical appointments or like you said, you know, going back and forth to the courts, mm -hmm. all of right. those things. That's I right. have seen individuals who have lost their jobs right. as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's a serious uh, issue and 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 you sometimes you feel so isolated, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in this experience because it is such a, it's something that women you know don't share, mm -hmm. right. you know, um, because of um, you know the shame or or like you were saying the mm -hmm. the failure. Yes. But, but even even though you're the one that's being victimized, right. you know. So I, I do commend you for being able to to share your story. Thank How you. are you able to um, you know today? How are you able to, or how are you able to get out of that situation? We talked about the order, of, um, you know, the stay away for five years. Right. You left. How are you able to, um, you know, move on uh, today and and be able to, you know, even put that experience in in, in a book? Um, I mean, I could look back and mm -hmm. I, I don't cry anymore mm -hmm. when I. Uh, when I think about it, mm -hmm. um, when mm -hmm. I do read my own book, mm -hmm. it stirs up a lot of emotions. Right. You know, one minute I'm sad, another mm -hmm. minute I'm mad, mm -hmm. another minute, you know, yeah. I just have those those mixed emotions with it mm -hmm. because I lived it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, how can individuals, um, you know, pick up your book? Or the first thing I, before that. When someone picks up your book, what what do you want them to get out of it? What do you want them to walk away with after reading your book? I want them to at least be aware of the warning signs mm -hmm. um, because they are there. Mm -hmm. um, and to actually try to mm. stay away right. from that type mm -hmm. and of what, what are the person. What are some warning signs that you would share with individuals? It would be... Um, Rushing into a relationship mm -hmm, is yep. one of them. That, right. um, the manipulation, mm -hmm. the ch extreme jealousy, and the possessiveness. Right. The controlling mm -hmm. and the isolation. Right. I also paid attention to mm. how he treated other people, because he didn't. He treated me like a queen, but he, the way he treated other people mm. and the rages that he mm -hmm. had. That over little, all the small things. Right. Those are the kind of things that if you get mad at something little like that, mm -hmm. imagine if something right. really big, mm -hmm. you'll you'll right. explode like right. a time bomb, you know. And and the manipulation you said manipulation, or those those signs, you know, I think a lot of times th those signs or or um, that you see, they're not extreme at first either. No. No. You know, they're kind of subtle, and I could see how someone would not really even you know, recognize it because they are so subtle and then right. they kind of get more intense as, uh, you know, as it goes on. Right. Um, you know, so 
being aware of those signs, like, you know, we were talking about, because um, I was telling, I was sharing with my daughter, you know, the book, and I was telling her about it, and mm -hmm. uh, we talked about jealousy, because you mentioned jealousy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people think, oh, that's cute, you know, oh, he loves me so much because he's so jealous. But if it becomes excessive, as yes. you said, that's mm -hmm. that's definitely uh, a signal to, yes. to kind of very Look dangerous mm -hmm. right yep. <laughs> <laughs> so how can individuals um, pick up your book um, it's available on amazon.com okay um, that is the, the best way to get it unless they want to do uh, Kindles also on Amazon okay. is also on Kobo dot com uh, Goodreads mm -hmm. um, so it is available for sale okay great and any um, thing that you could share with um, individuals in reference to this and getting help how they how they can go about um, you know seeking uh, you know counseling for this well and, and I think it's counseling it's ongoing mm -hmm. even after you know you are out of the um, the situation right mm -hmm. um, because what a lot of individuals would think is you know I'm out of the domestic violence situation and um, let me you know so I don't need counseling right you know we mm -hmm. all know there's still that taboo with regards to therapy right. and I think that's something that must stop and should stop right. uh, because of that um, you know everyone has a different view of therapy but it's totally different from man many people who come into therapy would say it's totally different from what I expected mm -hmm. and what I always say it's mm. like therapy it's like you know you buy something in the store mm -hmm. all right so you go to a therapist and it's not a good match right just don't stop yeah. Find another Find therapist. There are else. tons mm -hmm. of therapists That's out there. Point. There are certain um, websites you can go to, such as helppro.com. Mm -hmm. You have psychology today. You have good therapy. Okay. Um, there you can find a lot of different therapists. Again, too, one of the things a lot of individuals would think about is, you know, insurance, mm -hmm. the, you know, right. the coinsurance. What I always tell everyone, many jobs, especially if the person is working, they have what they call EAP. That's Employee Assistance Program. Okay. And many individuals don't even know that they do have free sessions through EAP. And okay. the employers know nothing about it. Wow. For many companies, actually, the EAP is not only for themselves, but it's for any member who is residing in the household. Hmm. So part of it is, if you're not aware of um, what your company has, go to your HR department. Okay. Do I have um, EAP? Mm -hmm. And I always, especially if someone has a very high co-insurance or have a very high co-payment, yes, I always right. tell them that way. Check with your HR and more often... Hmm. More times than not, they do have that service that they are not, that resource they are not aware of. And EAP stands for? Employee Assistance Program. Employee Assistance yes. Program. Okay. That's really good to know because I, I did not know that. Yes. Because, um, like you said, sometimes the, co and if you're going once a week mm -hmm. to speak with someone and you're paying $30, $45, uh, you know, that kind of adds up and mm -hmm. some sometimes people mm -hmm. are deterred from seeking out that help. So that's Absolutely. that's an excellent um point and you also have a private practice um you know in uh on long island yes. in suffolk county right yes. uh so people can you know definitely we we showed your website before um where you're located um you know for services um and you take insurance and yes all i that take too. most insurance yeah um so i i want to thank um you know both of you for being here um thank you so much for mm. sharing your story you. and we are so happy that you you are here and you're strong and you were able to tell your story thank so you. god thank bless you, you. <laughs> and thank you dr marson as always a wealth of information i want to thank you for for joining us thank uh, you for having this me. was this was great information and it really i'm sure will help a lot of women out there so i really i really appreciate okay. it thank you thank you so thank you for watching conversations with Verdell jones uh, we, we had an awesome show today. Uh, I just want to tell everyone out there, uh, you know, you can follow me um, on YouTube. You can check out the YouTube channel with past episodes. This one I'm going to upload uh, within the next couple of days. And uh, thanks again for watching and have a good night.